Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined today by Judy Singer. Judy is sometimes known as the mother of neurodiversity because Judy coined the term. So um, this is something that uh, you know, we, we've uh, talked about a lot recently on Access Chat. So it's great to actually feature the person that uh, that brought this term to into being. So Judy. Um, Thank you for joining us from Australia. Um, we've managed to find a slot that works for the time zone difference. Great to have you with us. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and also how you came about, about, how the term came about? Okay, so, um, well, I, I guess that it starts with my mother. Um, I always thought there was something a bit different about her and I didn't know what it was um, and then I went and looked her up on um, in the psychiatric textbooks this was when I was about 15 finally got allowed to go to the library by myself immediately looked her up and found nothing nothing describing her and her behaviors so I kind of thought um, yeah, I thought she was behaving, she was deliberately being stupid and lazy, I'm afraid. Um, so it was not a happy childhood. Um, and then I just left it at that and we had quite a lot of um, conflict. Um, and then when my daughter was born, this was 30 years ago now, um, I, I realised that there was something about her that was very much like my mother. And I, that's when the penny dropped. There's something hereditary here. She's not, this is not um, chosen behaviour. And that was where it began. And that, eventually I started to realise, well, actually people thought I was a bit odd as well. And that's where it came from. And then there began this process of trying to find out what it was that was affecting our family. And I started to read um, a book about disability by an Anne Shearer and that was called Disability Who's Handicapped and I suddenly it totally reframed how I was thinking about it you know and I when I read it that it, that it wasn't our fault um, and I remember I just cried all night when I read this book and as it happened by this stage I've been supported by my father. Um, it's quite, it is difficult raising an autistic child when nobody's even heard about it. Nobody understands. You get, you have to develop. Well, it, in those days, um, Asperger's had only been named. Um, and I lost so many friends. You know, people blamed me for my daughter's behaviour or what they thought was their odd behaviour. I lost friends. Some people said, oh, it's because you're too strict. Other people said it's because you're too lenient, you know, so, and um, yeah, no support whatsoever. And I knew there was something, but everybody thought, and this is such a common story for my generation with our kids, everybody thought, oh, she's just been neurotic. And um, this went on and I just developed a thick hide and I, I decided that I was going to, I knew what my daughter needed and I, I um, protected her as much as I could. Um, I made sure that she, um, I protected her at school. I got involved in P and C's and I kept looking and we sort of fell in with ADHD a bit. That was the nearest thing. And then, so we had some kind of label to hang on to, but it was when I read um, Oliver Sacks, um and the story of Temple Grandin that I had the big aha moment because I actually had thought my daughter was autistic when when I was looking through what what is it something's going on here and I read the book and then when I came to autism like literally my heart froze because it was just considered the most awful disability you could have. and then I thought but she can't be autistic because she's the most loving affectionate child I've ever seen so and then when I heard about Asperger's um, that's when the penny dropped and so finally we had an answer and at that stage my father had supported me a lot which allowed me to work but um, 
unfortunately he died and it was very hard to get um child care for Ellie because she didn't engage people and they weren't didn't know what to do um so they you know they ascribed all sorts of things to that so um the only thing I could do then and I was very poor as well was to get to go to uni so I I did a degree and I discovered disability studies and that was like the big aha moment which just totally changed my life and then I went on to do honours and I was invited to join the Australian the Sydney Disability Research Network with a lot of academics in it and that was a really great time and I started to develop this I did a, wrote a thesis, which I'm very proud of. It was only an honours thesis, but it was the first time, I think, as far as I know, that anyone actually looked at, at this from a sociological point of view. And my interest was trying to understand my, my family history. It was also, but it was also, um, what intrigued me was, well, how come this disability has suddenly come out of nowhere? Um, so my part of my research was about understanding what it was about the postmodern era that suddenly created this um, um, new form of disability, which was um, had just always been written off as eccentricity or something the parents did. And I joined online support groups, lots of different ones. One for, one's for um, my, my um, I, start, I started the world's first support group for people who had autistic parents as well. Um, and then I joined support groups and became very involved in those. Um, and I, I worked on my thesis and it was a new paradigm for disability studies because this is one of the bones of, of contention because I started in the social model of disability, but I really found that um, I didn't think it was enough to cover um, this new phenomenon because it was a totally different kind of disability. Um, am I talking too much too fast? I'm sort of no, no. Of, no, no, this is, this is fine. I'm, I'm, I'm can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you fine. So uh, it, it, it's fascinating, okay. so, uh, and we're um, definitely interested in in the different models and reasons and social constructs. So please carry on. Yeah, sure. So I found that the social model was not enough. Um, it, at that stage, there were only three categories of disability, and you probably had that in Britain too. It was physical intellectual and mental illness, the grab bag for everything else that nobody understood. And so the social model had been worked out by people with physical disabilities, mostly. Um, I was very influenced by Tom Oliver. He was, you probably have heard of him. He's kind of the father of the social model. Brilliant work. But I found that with autistic people, we didn't mind the medical model. We were very glad to get a diagnosis um, and because it allowed us to meet each other. And I thought that the medical model was actually quite helpful as a source of all kinds of meta science-based metaphors. And, you know, there were computer-based metaphors. And even putting those together was not enough. So what I found, what I experienced when I was in the, um, some of these social model, you know, sort of, oh, I don't know, anyway, just social model um, workshops, I remember coming out of one and thinking, we might, as, we might as well be creationists because of our total disregard of biology as if biology doesn't exist. And um, so I, added the medical model as well like I wanted to find a synthesis and but then even that was not enough and then I came across the work of Leonard Davis I don't know if you heard of him 
Um, he. No, I'm not familiar. Um, yes, yeah, so Leonard Davis um, was the was another social model theorist of the the deaf. He, he wrote a lot of books. His particularly a book called Enforcing Normalcy. It was really a lot of it was about the deaf movement because they were the people who pioneered um, disability or deafness as a form of ethnicity, as a linguistic minority, rather than um, as, as a disability. They didn't consider themselves disabled. And I thought, wow, we're a neurological minority. And um, so that's really, I put the three together, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and and so that's how concept of neurodiversity came about. In in, I, I can totally understand the the whole um, desire to find something that that fits better than 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 the social model. I'm I'm a fan of the empowerment part of the social model because you know. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful, but at the same time, it, it can reduce your identity, and it doesn't always reflect the fully the some of the difficulties of day-to-day -day life, which aren't always caused by other You're people's dropping. decisions. Did you hear me? Okay. Yeah, uh, you're know. dropping out. Um, Sorry about that. I, I had some problems with, um, my, with so, my connectivity. What I was saying. Uh, and yeah. I'll so do you want? I'll just go. keep talking. About okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um. What was I going to say? I will. T I can tell you while you're typing about where the word actually came from. Yes. Um, so can you hear me? Okay. Like, so um, it's a bit difficult across continents. We couldn't be further away from each other, I guess. Um, so based, part of it was um, the decline of um, psychotherapy. Um, psychotherapy was falling into a lot of disrepute. It was, you know, the subject of many jokes about, you know, the Freudian stuff and the casting couch and costing a fortune and people going for decades and never changing. And um, along came neuroscience. And, for, you know, for us, we looked at psychiatry as a priest, as a sort of high priesthood of, of secular society. And I guess I realised that the neuroscientists were, were taking over that that role. So it, so that's where I got the neuro from. And then the diversity I got from the green movement. Um, and um, I've got a little, I've got an anecdote, which I might as well tell you, I'll try and be quick. So I was at a, I'm Jewish and I was at a, at a study group. I'm not, I'm not religious, but it was um, some kind of study group. And they asked us to come up with a better Ten Commandments, and I thought, oh, this is so going to be rigged. I'm not going to be able to win this, but I thought I can do better than God. Sorry if anyone's religious. And my first commandment was honour diversity, lest we all end up cactus, because if that had been the first commandment, we wouldn't have all the wars that we have now. So, I, so of course, nobody heard me and they ignored me. But it, st it stayed with me, and I thought, yeah, diversity is the most important thing in the world. Put together neuro and diversity, piggyback on the on the the rise of this new priesthood, make ourselves sound really legitimate, not just a bunch of whingers. We're neurodiverse, and that's where it came from. And I I also was this was when I was on an online group called run by Martin Decker, which was fabulous. It was just full of, first of all, it was an e-group. So we, you know, we just typed our hearts out. Like we had really long conversations, very intelligent conversations exploring our identity. Harvey Bloom was on it as well. 
Um, so he and I, he and I were really the only people I think anywhere that kind of got the bigger social implications of this. Like everyone was still very much in the self-help model or the medical model, but I was interested in society and Harvey was interested in literature. Um, he That was his job. He interviewed writers, very brilliant guy. And we, we threw the ideas around neurological diversity. Um, I think I'm the one that, that came up, you know, just put it together because in a, I remember a conversation where I was saying, you know, we really need a movement um, for not just us because we were already talking about autistics and cousins, which was the cousins were ADHD. And I thought it's, this is bigger than just autism. And so we need an umbrella movement. And I said this, and I remember saying this, um, like we need a movement and can't, neurological diversity is just too much of a mouthful. Let's make it neurodiversity. And that's how it, kind of happened but I didn't you know it was only two or three sentences in my thesis and I just thought I forgot about it to be honest I didn't even think much about it it was just but I didn't quite know all the ramifications I just knew it was perfect for the times and I didn't it was an intuition I guess uh, 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 some, uh, somehow, and considering the the story of your your personal story, you no know, writing that was basically something normal. Probably it was unusual for uh, for others. So my question is: How did how did your peers at the when you were at university uh, react to that? Well. I think, well, first of all, I was an honours student and these were all kind of much heavier ac academics. Um, and I learned so much from them, um, but I don't know that they really, under like I knew I was onto something huge. I knew this was gonna, in fact, I wrote in my thesis that, um, that I, that I think I did anyway, that autism would be the metaphor for the computer age, that would be the disability metaphor. I was following on again from Leonard Davis, who said the deafness was the metaphor. He had some reasons for that. And I thought, no, this is the age of autism. And I, you know, the, the rise of, of computers. And I said in that, that in my thesis, that the, that computers, I don't know whether this is totally true, but I did think that the computers were the prosthetic device invented by autistics for autistics that turned them into social beings. So I knew that this was going to be, I think I've got off topic. No, no, um, no. This is remind, me, remind me of your question again. Did I, I must say, Aging brain is a part of neurodiversity, seriously. My memory is really, don't smile, it's not funny. I'm no. cold and no. I forget. No, no that's was, okay. The, it was about um, how did your uh, peers and people at university reacted uh, uh, to your work? Right. So because, you know, the disability, I think the disability um, model the social model was state of the art then. And because I didn't buy it, they kept insisting that it, they thought I just didn't understand it. They thought I was, you know, the past and I didn't get it. And on the contrary, I thought I was the future and they didn't get it, but I didn't have much traction. Um, and I just did what I wanted to do with my thesis and I used what I could, and yeah, because I, I, I you understood. Because I, I I study sociology in and applied research, 
So, uh, and so uh, my, my area of study is, all, is, all, is very pragmatic in terms of research and basically connecting with people, doing a lot of uh, uh, case studies and, and basically connecting with people in order to obtain information. And, uh, and I, I had a lot of colleagues, even there, my colleagues uh, today were very into staying in the academia and that's how they were leaving their world. So, Judy, your story, you have lived that. So, you were part, what you were constructing of what you're looking, somehow was very connected with your own personal life. And, and I think that mm -hmm. created, uh, uh, you know, somehow, you know, an opportunity that was also unique and I that some people might not be able to understand that because they were not as connected as you were, uh, but that's just a <laughs> that's just a, a personal opinion. Well, I had a lot of challenges because I was a sole parent without any family support. The poverty, like disability, can be a poverty trap, and I really couldn't keep going in sociology and. I'm just, I guess I want to be a free thinker and as a discipline, I just, I didn't want to have a sociological career because I'm, I, I'm a sort of autodidact. I want to link lots of different things together. And um, I was going to say something, but I can't remember what it was. But I found, I found, I found in fact that that the sociological knowledge is actually the base of sociology that gives you some of the resources to make all those connections. I think it's very difficult to find other discipline that can give you that. I did, well, yeah, I mean, I really felt that I was standing on the shoulders of giants, but what was difficult for me with sociology, uh, this is a horror, they don't, you know, if you say this, it, it's a discipline that never mentions suffering or love. And they're the two most important things that, that drive the world. And I didn't like the jargon, so I didn't really want to go further. And, and anyway, I had to make a living, you know, um, just had to get out. So, but now I'm thinking, you know, there's so many things I would like to research and, um, particularly, I guess, the pragmatics of it now. I mean, I, I see all these industries mushrooming up. Um, um, what, do you, what would you call all these startups, HR training, um, all these things? And I want to know how effective they are. I want to know, is this like a tulip mania bubble? Um, are they reaching, is it a middle class thing? You know, I mean, I, I'm, I am a leftist. Um, but there's so many things that, I'm, that I'd like to know. And when I went to the UK, so the other part of it, of course, is this, which I was going to talk about, was the absolute horror of being in Australia. And basically I felt like I, I knocked on so many doors and, and, being over here, like one of the reasons I was able to do this is because I had a bird's eye view of both the American models of, and the British and the European. So I was able to put all those together from a bird's eye view. When it came to, I would have so liked to be involved in it, but I knocked on so many doors and, you know, and then to be discovered. 20, you know, like, well, three, about three or four years ago, maybe, it caused me so much pain. It was like coming out of the permafrost, you know, I just cut, you know, that was my passion. And I just cut it right off. And I want to get back in it. And so since I've got back from the UK um, and America, where I had speaking, um, I don't know if this is interesting to you, but it's very interesting to me. I really, it was really, really hard to come back when I had so many ideas, you know, and so many new directions to go in and wanting to stay connected and just knowing that I'm drifting away and nowhere to go with my ideas, Twitter, just 
had the most horrible time on Twitter. And, but yeah, this is important to me. Sorry if it's a bit boring, but. No, no. Yeah, but on the other hand, I'm starting to meet people in Australia now, I'm starting to network. So over the next, next month, uh, some really interesting things are starting to happen. So I'm very excited about that. And I might find some kind of way of researching this. And, and so so you, you just alluded to you know, there being a bit of a dark place on on Twitter. You uh, and you've been quite firm about the idea that there are both light and dark sides to neurodiversity, mm -hmm. because a lot of the stuff that is mushrooming mushrooming up now is so accentuating the positive and we need to do some of that because to to balance out the the negative views of society before but there, but but equally um we can't suddenly undo the the fact that that sometimes you know there are um there are these dark sides to um to, to neurodiverse people we're not all saints as well um, and and that's something that I think, it, it, you know, we've got a bit of a revisionist history going on now around neurodiversity, where we're all you know, like closet geniuses, and we're going back and identifying people in the past that we think are neurodiverse. Um, and yeah, you know, we all, we all worked all that out 20 years ago. We've got we've got our lists, but I think. Yeah. Um, the first thing about neurodiversity is, of course, it's absolutely nothing new under the sun. It's just saying everybody's different. Yeah. That's it. So, of course, there's dark and light, you know. I mean, when you think about it, people have been battling about the problem of evil and the problem of democracy forever, and that that, that is not new. Um, the other problem is, you know, this because you said neurodiverse people, which – I really have to say something about because we are all neurodiverse, of course. Yes. And I understand that language evolves. So I'm really at the point of, you know, just throwing my hands up and saying, okay, let neurodiverse be a synonym for neurodivergent because it's convenient and we've all broken our heads about a better word. To me, I prefer neurominority. So I, I I get you I, I I understand and and what I'm doing is I'm slipping into the language that is commonly used um, for me it, it's grammatically incorrect um, you know um, because you're right we you know diversity reflects the totality and uh, divergent reflects the 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 fact that we are not part of that larger norm. That we, you know, uh, so therefore, yeah, we are a minority. The issues with, you know, and with minority come issues. You know, there come issues of prejudice, misunderstanding, uh, but at the same time, you know, we have stuff to offer. So I, I think the language is tricky because um, wherever you go in the world, there will always be someone that interprets something differently and takes offense at whichever. <laughs> language yeah. you use, however well intentioned. Um I, I guess that to and, and to a certain extent maybe academia is the place to resolve that, but then maybe it's not because actually quite often there can be a disconnect. So I don't know. I I I struggle with finding the right words and sometimes I slip into the 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 language that is commonly used, but I think your point is absolutely right. We need, you know. We're... Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not really judgmental about it anymore. I just kind of keep, I keep wanting to keep neurodiversity as a thing to remind us all that we're all different. And yeah, I'm, I don't feel punitive. I kind of, I, I, I accept it now that that's the way the language is evolving. But I do put my faith in the dialectical process, which is like. I don't know. It's a, I don't know if you know what the dialectical process is, but I'm sure Ant, Ant, mm -hmm. Antonio. Antonio. No, it's it's so simple. It's like you have this great idea, and it's going to save the world, and it 
creates a sense antithesis. You know, some there's always some it's always going to be flawed, and some people are going to jump on it. So there's the thesis, and then there's the antithesis, and then you know there's people fight it, and then it evolves. There's a new synthesis, and that's what's going to happen. And if the word is, I mean. If it if it's not useful, it'll die off. I because so many people now have their business models based on helping neurodiverse people, what they call neurodiverse people. I'm very reluctant to kind of go barging in and saying you can't do that. You know, you've got to change your business model. I mean, if it's helping people, meaning of words change. <sighs> No, my only concern in relation to that is sometimes I observe that uh, some groups helping to people, people uh, fa especially families uh, with autistic uh, kids or, or family members, is like they they create a kind of a, an illusion of possible uh, that creates uh, false hopes to family members, and that's the part that I found a bit dangerous. Well, I, I mean, looking at it realistically, first of all, the people who pioneer it are the good people, and then it, then there's the cowboys that come because they think it's going to be business. And uh, there is some. Um, there's a woman, a young woman in England, who's done some fabulous work on on that, on evaluating it. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, well, but the bigger picture, of course, is that, you know, our society is failing at the moment. Like in Australia, I think there's 19 people, unemployed people, for every single job vacancy. And as in most countries, the we've got right-wing Tory governments. But even Labor governments haven't done much in terms of they're very they're still very punitive about employment. And there's this whole it's almost this religious thing that if you get a job, suddenly everything will be okay. Like it's it's just like we should be able to respect people and not force everyone into into work. It's almost a religion and you know 19 to 1. And so one of my big interests is um, uh, the punitive attitude to unemployed people. I would rather change that than see people shoe. And also to see, I'd rather change that than to see people shoehorned into all sorts of jobs because a lot of jobs are just not fitting a com complex human being, you know, there's really shitty jobs out there. So, so that's why I'm interested, like what's really happening? At, you know, how do we regulate this and in industry and how do we evaluate? And, you know, as example, in Europe, you know, even in Portugal and in Ireland, we have a minority of, of travels and, and they have their own way. They don't. Uh, they have their own way of living. They they want to do things like that, like in the way that sometimes doesn't fit in what you just uh, describe it. And and sometimes the 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 environment, uh, or, you know, the media or society in general is always trying to find ways where they fit instead of letting be where they are who, who they are. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, in agriculture, we allow fields, I don't know, we probably still don't, but we sure, we used to allow fields to lie fallow. You know, you need, some people don't really find themselves. I didn't find myself till my late 40s or 50s. Um, you know, this this preoccupation with, with work is just, I always think of, you know, the sign on Auschwitz, it was Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free. No, it doesn't. <laughs> You know, that's the logic of it for me. Yeah. All right. So I, I I know it's a platitude, but they say if if you know if you're if you follow your passion, you'll not work a, a day in your life. And I think that that 
there's some there's a grain of truth in that platitude uh, um, but it's very difficult for people to find that thing that they want to pursue and to make a living from doing something that they love yeah. when society is constructed in such a way that the expectation is you're going to turn up you're going to do your nine to five you're going to take home your salary and, and, and suck it up so i think that there is we're at an inflection point because what's happening with so societal and technology models is that that um the current ways of working are, are failing the technology is coming and you've got the economies of platforms and you've got gig economies which are fraught with risk but at the same time are going to uh probably uh, be the catalyst to new ways of of delivering stuff uh to look at things like um you know universal basic income to to allow people to to do the things that they that they're good at that they're passionate about that that can enrich society. Uh, Neil, but, yes, uh, I was about to say, a universal basic income would be great. And what's happened in Australia is we've got this national insurance disability insurance scheme now, and it just costs gazillions. It's very inefficient at the moment. Um, and my daughter's just got got the NDIS, and there's coordinators who coordinate the coordinators. And then I have to coordinate all of them. And I'm just thinking, why couldn't you just make the disability pension a living wage so that people could buy what they want instead of getting these huge buckets of money that they don't know how to spend if they're lucky enough to? So it's kind of because we don't trust people and we just we have got this punitive work ethic, we just don't want to give anything away and the, our society is so rich yeah i think that's that, that that whole fundamental of trust is something that we need to 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 re-examine trust in society trust in business um the cost of not trusting is mm -hmm. far greater than the cost of uh, a lot of times is far greater than the cost of of the putting in place the checks and balances and infrastructure to um to prevent a breach of trust there will always exactly. be breaches of trust right some people yeah. will do something bad but the cost of mopping up after someone doing something bad is less than the cost of trusting most people to be good and 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 that's something that i i struggle with because for me that's obvious but i but i see time and time again in business and society that it's it's not the case and so we we create these huge bureaucracies and these barriers to enabling people to do good stuff as a result of our fear of someone doing bad stuff one of the things that I'm hopeful for this new, all these neurodiversity startups is that disability inclusion, as you know, done by government, never really worked. So I was hoping that this new positive, you know, getting neurodivergent people into the workforce by emphasising their skills, but at the same time, we will slow down the pace of work if it becomes widespread and so in a way we might be humanizing the workplace a lot more so that that is my hope because it's the pace of of um all right i'm going to use the c word capitalism is that increasing pace that puts people under so much pressure and i really learned that so I went when I was in Florida, I went to the National Stuttering Association and stuttering is a they were interested in neurodiversity and they're a lot it's really interesting reading this stuff because they talk about the pace of speech so much. And so now pace is like something that I think neurodiversity should be really looking at. Yeah. Blowing uh, the pace. 
yeah of the work for this uh and and yet the the push is in the opposite direction the push is faster 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 ever ever in, ever accelerating so but whether that has to be human acceleration is a is a question you know whether some of that can be done by technology and allowing us to to spend time to cogitate to ruminate on stuff and and uh, uh, because yeah, we're definitely like candles burning at both ends, and at some point we're going to burn out. Yeah, I was just noticing here in Australia, a lot of autistic girls, particularly, do librarianship courses. It's a very good. It's actually I worked in a library as well. Um, or some actually I grew up, I worked in IT for before I was a mother. Um, so, and I could, they're building magnificent libraries now. And, um, but there's hardly any staff. And all this, a lot of my autistic friends, including my daughter, has spent years volunteering. So there is a job there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's yeah, another absolutely. thing. It's a disabled labor. Or, you know, volunteers like me, because just because I was at Clara and I couldn't do a, a full time jobs, I spent, I just did almost everything as a volunteer. And yeah, that's just another, I don't know if I'm going off topic here, but I think that's a really big issue for neurodiversity, the exploitation of disabled labour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. Not just for neurodiversity, but in in you know places like America, where you, you essentially can't have a full time job if you have a a high level of disability benefits, because you will end up being financially penalised for working. So you get uh, into this mm -hmm. vicious cycle. And Neil, and and some of those advocates. I've got of... that myself. Yeah. I've got uh, that myself. I'm a sole uh, parent. I live in housing. The more if I earn. Actually, I, they can't kick me out because of a grandfathering thing, but it's a total disincentive to do it. It's actually a poverty trap, you know? Yeah. But, you know, uh, you, you, Neil, you were mentioned about this, the, the fact that, you know, following your passion and most of the gurus mm -hmm. of that uh, in North America are quite fond of advocating, oh, if you, you should work for free, you should, you know, someone is giving you the privilege of working for them, you should take the opportunity. And I, I feel that is quite a, a risky and dangerous way of uh, uh, talking with people and driving them to create something. When at the, so you want them to be innovators, you want them to follow their passion, but you are putting it into a path that, you know, if they don't achieve what you somehow trying to promise them that they will achieve, it's uh, basically a direct path for mental health. Issues. So who says this? This is bizarre. They it's, say you should have to do it for nothing. It, that's what it, that's it, what we do. That's why my daughter does it. She's happier to go and work in a library because she loves it for nothing. And it's just exploitation. It's like, you know, she'd like to be able to buy books, you know. Well you can't buy books so she's this dollar. No, anyway, it's just not on, is it? It's not on. No, uh, no that's uh, that's somehow uh, some of good, the, the gurus of uh, startup America. Are uh, they? Of, some of them often advocate for that. Yeah. The, the oh, whole sort of bootstrapping me. thing. The, the the concept that you know you you go and do your 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 work for free. You, you work on your passion for free. You pay your dues by working for free and then good things will come when actually what you're doing is you know making someone else rich at the at your expense and at the expense of your your health and mental health we've we we're running out of time so I, I i just want to say thank you very much judy i know we've had a few glitches with the sound but it's been a fascinating conversation need to thank our sponsors and friends and people like Barclays Access and Microlink and 
and my clear text for keeping us accessible and captioned and fed and watered and the lights on so um thanks to to all of our supporters and we really look forward to you joining us on twitter thank you yeah it was really great to talk <laughs>